Welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology series on the gastrointestinal system or the digestive system. The overall point of the digestive system is to digest your food. The food that we take in um, to our bodies is extremely complex. We have these really large molecules that are just too big to be absorbed into the body and then too complex to be utilized by our cells. So our digestive system digests food. It breaks it down both mechanically or physically by chewing and dissolving the food and we also break it down chemically. We've got enzymes that come in and break chemical bonds to free up these nice small nutrients like glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids that we can then absorb into the body and utilize. When we look at the digestive system, the major organ that we're going to see is the alimentary canal. This is what we typically call the GI tract or the digestive tract. The alimentary canal begins at the oral cavity or the mouth, and then it's one continuous tube that goes all the way down until it exits the body at the anus. When we look at the alimentary canal, we're gonna start uh, where food starts, which is in the mouth or the oral cavity. So when we look right here, um, this space, the open space that we see right here in the mouth um, is the oral cavity or the oral vestibule. When we look in the mouth, we'll see the tongue. We'll also see the teeth and the gums, which we'll look at in a second. And then we see that we have three pairs of salivary glands that are associated with the mouth. Salivary glands obviously produce saliva, this liquid that lubricates, um, moistens, and dissolves the food in our mouth. It also has some enzymes like salivary amylase, but we'll talk, to the, we'll talk about those in class. So again, we have three pairs of salivary glands. If you look on this side, Right here, um, this very superficial gland that's just anterior or just in front of the ear is called the parotid gland. This, this large superficial one is the parotid gland. If we look on this side, we see two other glands. Right here, right underneath the tongue, this is the sublingual gland. Again, sub is beneath, lingual is the tongue. So the sublingual gland is beneath the tongue. Then this one back here is the submandibular gland. Remember the bottom jaw, the lower jaw is the mandible. So the submandibular gland is underneath the mandible. Okay, submandibular gland, sublingual gland, parotid gland. Obviously the mouth um, is the oral cavity or you could say oral vestibule. When we look in the oral cavity, um, one of the major things that we do in there is break our food down mechanically, right? Physically, we chew it, we mush it, we tear it apart. Um, this makes it easier to swallow, and this gives us a greater surface area for our digestive enzymes to work. When we look in the oral cavity, we see that we have 32 teeth. Okay, so we kind of break the mouth up into four quadrants. We have eight teeth in each of those four quadrants to equal 32 teeth total. You guys should be able to look at the teeth and tell me what kind of tooth it is you're looking at. And you should be able to tell me the different parts of each tooth and the substances that make up the teeth. So we'll start with that. Looking here at this model, um, this rather large tooth model, we can see the different parts of the tooth. The tooth is divided into three parts, the root, the neck, and the crown. The part down here that's underneath the surface of the gums, this is the root. Okay, just like the roots of a tree go underneath the ground, the roots of the tooth go underneath the surface of the gums. Okay, again, this is where we anchor the tooth down into the tooth socket. So these are the roots. This kind of thin area right here where we connect the root and the crown is called the neck. So this little area right here is the neck. That makes the top part of the tooth Hey, all of this part up here that you can actually see and feel the crown. Just like a crown goes on the top of your head, the crown of the tooth is the top of the tooth. Now, when we look at the tooth, it's made up of multiple different types of substances. So the substance that covers the root is called cement or cementum. The substance that covers the crown is called enamel. The enamel is actually the hardest substance that you have in your body. So this is all covered with enamel. If I open this up, you guys will see that underneath, we have another hard substance that's called dentin. You can see it looks kind of bumpy or a little bit porous here on this model. All of this, so down here in the root and up here in the crown, this is all dentin. 
Then finally, um, in the very center portion of the tooth, we have a substance called pulp. Now this is not a hard substance. This is a soft vascular substance. Okay, this is pulp in the very center. If I look at this model here, Okay, you guys can see a few things. One, you see the numbering system of the teeth here. You can see how in each quadrant there are eight teeth. Okay, so eight, 16, 24, 32 teeth total. Looking over here, you can see the different um, regions of the tooth. Again, the part underneath the surface of the gums down here where we anchor the tooth down in the bone. This is the root, the top um, exposed portion of the tooth is the crown and this thin area where they connect right here is the neck. You can also see the gums right here, okay? And the gums are technically called gingiva. That's where that term gingivitis comes from. You guys know that itis means inflammation. So gingivitis is an inflammation of the gingiva or inflammation of the gums. Okay, so this number 25, this pink area that you see right here is showing you the gingiva or the gums. You can also see where the pulp is in the center. You can see the dentin, the enamel, and then also the cement or cementum outside of the root. Now, I told you that we have all different types of teeth and you guys should be able to identify what type of tooth it is that you're looking at. Okay, in any quadrant, the first or front two teeth that you'll see are called incisors. Okay, these are the ones that you typically bite something off of. You take a bite with your incisors. Now you have central incisors. Those are the, the first incisors, the ones that are towards the center. And then the second incisor um, is the lateral incisor. So in any quadrant, you have two incisors, a central and a lateral incisor. Then you have one canine, or you could call this the cuspid. It's called canine um, because it's that sharp canine tooth, like in dogs or wolves, they have that really long tooth. It's called cuspid because it has one what we call cusp. And we'll look at a bigger model where you can see kind of like the one point or cusp on it. After that one cuspid or canine, you have two teeth that are called premolars, okay, because they come before the molars. They're also called bicuspid. Um, again, I'll show you why in the big model. Then finally, you have three molars. Okay, so two incisors, one canine, two premolars, three molars. And the third molar is hard to see because it's kind of embedded back here. That's what you would typically call like your wisdom teeth. Either we, we normally get removed because we don't have room for them. So let's look at these individual models. This is showing us an incisor. Okay, you notice it's a relatively small tooth with a single root. And looking at the top of it, it is flat. Okay, it comes to one single peak here, and it is flat on the top. That's an incisor. This is showing you a canine or cuspid. Again, it comes to one peak. There's no flat surface here. There's not like a broad surface. It comes to one peak. But when we look at this one peak, notice that it is not flat. It has this point. It comes to a cusp. So we call it cuspid. Again, or canine would work. After that, we get to the premolars. Okay, they're a little bit bigger. And notice they do have this broad surface for chewing. Okay, they do have a broader surface. And when you look at it, it has two peaks or points, two cusps. So we call it bicuspid. There's a cusp in the front and a cusp in the back. Okay, so bicuspid or premolar. Finally, we get to the molars. These are the big guys. Okay, so look at this tooth, it is huge. We've got numerous roots to anchor it because it is so large. And then look at the surface. It's got this huge surface here for chewing. Okay, so that's obviously a molar. That's it for the oral cavity. After the oral cavity, the food gets pushed down back into the pharynx or throat. 
remember that the pharynx or throat actually has three regions to it. The nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So if we look at this right here, right here, this is the oral cavity, and then the food gets pushed back into the pharynx or the throat. Um, the food should not actually go into the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx, remember, is this top part here. It goes from right here to right here. Okay, so this top part is the nasopharynx. Air passes through it. Food and water shouldn't actually go up there. Okay, but still know it. After that, we get to the oropharynx. The oropharynx extends from the end of the soft palate down to the hyoid bone, which you see right here. So if I draw a line over, this is the oropharynx. It's just the part behind the oral cavity. Then the last part of the throat is the laryngopharynx. It's behind the larynx or voice box. So we call it the laryngopharynx. After the pharynx, the food goes down into the esophagus. So this long, thin, muscular tube is showing us the esophagus. That's gonna carry the food down through the thoracic cavity and it's gonna go right through the diaphragm, which would sit like right here, and pass down into the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, so this is showing us the esophagus that carries food into the stomach. At the very bottom of the esophagus, so like right here, see how the esophagus thins out, how it looks tight right here, it looks thinner? That's showing us the lower esophageal sphincter, or it's also called the cardiac sphincter because it's right by the cardia of the stomach. This lower esophageal sphincter, remember, is important. It's a, a sphincter, a circular band of muscle, and it essentially acts like a top or a lid that squeezes tight to make sure that the stomach contents stay in the stomach. In class, we talk about how um, the stomach breaks food down and digests it using hydrochloric acid pH of one, super acidic. It burns and eats away at things. The stomach is equipped to deal with that acid. The acid does not hurt the stomach. But if that acid washes up into the esophagus or the pharynx or throat, it hurts, it burns and eats away. So we need to keep that acid in the stomach. We do that with this um, lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter that you see right here. When that doesn't work appropriately and the acid washes up, that's heartburn. Okay, or GERD, or acid reflux. That's what's happening there. That brings us to the stomach. Okay, looking at the stomach, the stomach has four regions, the cardia, fundus, body, and pylorus. The first section right here is the cardia. The cardia is literally just this one little area right here. That's just the part that food first enters into. That's it. The fundus is this swollen part that's up here. Okay, this kind of round dome that's at the top is the fundus. It's like for extra storage. When you eat a big meal and you need somewhere to put the food, it goes up into the fundus. The major part of the stomach right here is the body. Okay, that's where most of the digestion occurs in the stomach. Then finally, this last little J-shaped part that curves up right here, this is showing us the pylorus. So, cardia, fundus, body, pylorus. At the end of the stomach, right here, we have another sphincter. This is called the pyloric sphincter. It okay, makes sense, it's by the pylorus, the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter controls the flow of the chyme, the stuff in the stomach, from the stomach into the small intestine. Now look at the stomach, it's big, right? It's this big pouch and it can swell and expand when we fill it with food. So that's a lot of food that's here in the stomach. Look at the intestine, the small intestine is small. It's only like an inch in diameter. So we can't cram this whole meal into the small intestine at one time. We have to put little bits at a time in there. That's all that will fit. So the pyloric sphincter controls that. It'll relax, let a bit, a little bit of, of chyme or, or food through and then it contracts. Relax and lets a little bit through and then it contracts. This is also important because remember we said that the stomach is really acidic, okay? The intestines don't like that acid. So we can't dump all of this acid into the intestines at once, okay? That'll overwhelm the intestines and burn them. So we put a little bit of this acid chyme into the small intestine and then we neutralize the acid. Then we put a little bit more, we neutralize the acid. 
Okay, so putting it a little bit at a time um, works because of the anatomy, how small it is, and also because of the physiology so that we can get rid of that acid. Okay, so this is the stomach. Um, this was the pyloric sphincter. Looking at the stomach, you'll notice we have these two curves, right? There's a small curve right here, and then there's a larger curve right here. We call the small curve the lesser curvature, and we call the large curve the greater curvature. Makes sense. Lesser curvature, greater curvature. Now, these are important. These actually have these, these strong connective tissue membranes um, that are attached to them. Okay, so the lesser curvature has a membrane attached to it called the lesser omentum. The lesser omentum will stretch from the lesser curvature up to the liver. Okay, and that connects the two and, and it effectively suspends the stomach. Here holds the stomach in place by attaching it to the liver. Then from the greater curvature, we have another kind of thicker, more fatty membrane called the greater omentum. The greater omentum actually hangs from the greater curvature of the stomach, and then it hangs down over all of the intestines. And it's kind of like a bib, right? Like a bib just kind of hangs over your chest and protects your clothes underneath. Um, the greater omentum is just the thick fatty bib that hangs over the intestines and kind of protects them. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and stop there. And then the next video will continue from the small intestine on down.